Buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos a esta sesión del Centro de Compasión. Mi nombre es Naira Pacheco y yo seré su intérprete al español para esta sesión. Esta sesión será interpretada del inglés al español y para acceder a nuestra línea de interpretación telefónica, favor de llamar al 978-990-5357. Y cuando se le pida, marque el código de acceso 391-822. Por favor de mantener su micrófono en mudo para evitar ruidos de fondo. Hello everybody, welcome to this uh, Compassion Center session. My name is Naira Pacheco and I will be your interpreter. This session will be interpreted from English to Spanish. To access our interpretation call line in Spanish, please call 978 990-5357 and dial access code 391-822 pound when prompted. Please keep your microphones on mute to avoid background noise. Thank you. Thank you, Nida. And welcome everyone to the Santa Barbara Response Network, Compassion Center Live. This is um, a special Compassion Center that um, I have um, created today and am very pleased that uh, Council Member Oscar Gutierrez and uh, Ali Cortez from the Santa Barbara Response Network Board were able to join us for this special session. Um, it is fiestas. There are a lot of things to talk about. There are concerns, there are announcements. So we wanna have a conversation about our community, our youth during COVID and during fiestas. So this is a special conversation I'm welcoming you all to and very honored to have both Ali and Oscar here. I'm gonna do very brief introductions and then let them take it away. Um, Oscar Gutierrez is council member for Santa Barbara. And I heard the first millennial to serve on the council. He's an award-winning broadcast journalist and senior producer at Santa Barbara Television and very committed to sharing information with our community. So welcome, Oscar. Thank Ali you. Alejandro Cortez is, thank you, Oscar, is uh, on the Santa Barbara Response Network. She's the CEO of In a Different Point of View, which is a youth engagement and outreach program. She is the outreach specialist for the Santa, ba Santa Barbara Unified School District, where she and I have worked many, many responses in our schools for psychological support. Uh, the Santa Barbara Response Network works closely um, with the schools and other youth agencies to offer psychological first aid when there's been traumas and events in the schools. So um, Facebook Live Compassion Center started the first week of COVID launched by Ali, Irene, um, Sandra Weiss and I from the Santa Barbara Response Network to inform the community and offer support during COVID. So welcome and Ali, welcome and please um, start our conversation with Oscar. You may. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Bienvenidos, si nos están escuchando en español. Um, we want to communicate with everyone, and we want to bring in all the information up to date that you need to make awesome, great decisions for you, yourself, your family, and your community. Um, Oscar, thank you so much for being here with us today. The first millennial uh, to be serving in the Santa Barbara City Council. But maybe some people don't know that you also are Consider yourself lucky to have grown up in Santa Barbara. You graduated also from San Marcos High School. Um, I really wanna highlight all the things that you have done because leadership is so important. And sometimes we don't know, why is that person a leader? Why is that person giving a voice to our community? Um, you earned, uh, you went to Santa Barbara City College where you earned three national awards. Then you went to UCSB and didn't receive just, um, you received the honors in your film departments and you also won UCLA's best documentary. You have also worked at ABC, Warner Brothers and Univision. Wow, <laughs> that is incredible. Um, so, and so Oscar, 
how has your career in the film industry influenced you to be the leader you are today? Thank you. I, I want to thank you all for inviting me to, to be a part of this. I uh, really appreciate it and I appreciate everything your organization does for the community. Um, I, I grew up uh, listening to, to people tell stories in multiple languages, you know, English and Spanish, obviously mainly, uh, but also other languages because of film. Uh, I was able to watch films from China and Japan and France and Italy, and, and it kind of gave me this worldwide perspective, and, and, and I just really enjoyed telling stories. So um, when I got older, I was studying film and, and, and television, and uh, it got me to get into um, uh, journalism, um, mainly because when I was going to City College studying film, there is a situation with our local news press where the journalists felt that the owner of the newspaper wasn't being completely transparent about the way they ran their newspaper. So they protested and they boycotted. And that made a big influence on me because I grew up reading that newspaper. I actually sold those newspapers when I was younger. And, uh, and I decided to get into journalism that way because uh, those journalists came into the TV station to do a TV show of their own about everything that was going on. And uh, they had me be their director. So then um, I decided to go into studying journalism and, and I was reporting on stories and issues that um, the community didn't really focus on. You know, I was, I was reporting on uh, uh, veterans that were attending city college and the struggles they were going through coming back from serving uh, and then also interviewing uh, people who collect recyclables on campus and the harassment they were getting from, from people for doing that when they were just trying to provide for their families in this overpriced community that we live in. And those were kind of stories that people weren't hearing and, and I felt passionate about to tell their stories. And, and I just know from my experience of growing up here, I, I was able to relate with them and communicate with them um, compassionately. And uh, so in doing so and in, in getting into journalism, I, I got to start to interview local politicians and, uh, and report on what they were doing. And over the years, uh, it started to just kind of influence me a little more and more. And uh, one of my fellow local journalists um, at the time, she was a journalist, Kathy Mario, she decided to run for city council and, and, I, and I supported her. She, she only lived a block away from me and she became kind of an inspiration, you know, being a Latina and a journalist. And, and, uh, and when she got elected to be mayor, it left her seat on the city council open. So I thought about it and, and I asked, you know, do you think somebody like me would be a good fit? And she said, you know, ask, ask your friends and family and your neighbors if they would support you and if you get a lot more yeses and no's and then give it a try and, and that's what i did and i got way more yeses than no's and and uh i i started a campaign and and i and i got elected um because it i you know growing up on the west side my entire life i just felt like we weren't really getting the attention other parts of the city were and that always bothered me growing up. Um, and you could just see it, you can see it on our sidewalks, you can see it um, in our schools. It, it, was pretty, it was pretty obvious that we weren't being treated the same. And uh, you know, you grow up and there's, a, there's certain ways you can re respond to that. You can, you can grow up and, and just be like, well, that's just the way it is, like whatever, I'm just gonna carry on. Or you can, you can grow up like, what kind of like I, what I did and, and I said, you know, I'm not going to stand for it. I'm going to show people what's going on and I'm going to talk about it and I'm going to do something about it. And that's kind of what, what inspired me to, to, to run for the seat was that I, I wanted, you, you know, that famous saying, saying, um, be the change you want to see in the world. Uh, so I took it like really seriously. So I wanted to be that change. And, and uh, so far we've been, we've been doing some pretty good stuff and, 
and I'm looking forward to doing more. Obviously, uh, you know, every every night I go to sleep thinking like, what more could I have done today that I should have done? You know, and and it feels weird when I feel like I have an hour or two where I'm not doing anything. I always I'm always thinking to myself, there's something I should be doing or could be doing right now. Like, what is that? And it it's just a weird feeling to think like there's always stuff that I could be doing, you know, and, and it's and it's a little difficult to try to figure that out. But but yeah, that's how I got started, basically um, getting into local politics. And it all came from my drive of uh, of listening to stories and, and telling stories. Wow, Oscar, that is an amazing journey. And I think that our community is so lucky to have someone who's really passionate who really understands the importance of the stories and lifting voices and paving the pathway, right? Many people did that for you. You're giving back. I mean, it sounds like maybe you might be even losing some sleep <laughs> during this time, but you know, that's a, someone who has a vision, who has a dream and who wants to move the needle, right? You want to make a difference and you truly are. Um, when it comes to our community, you are listening to people, you're observing, you have a history yourself here. Um, what was it like for you to be a young teen here in Santa Barbara? And what are maybe some of the differences, fast forward now, that you would like to change or make a difference for youth? Um, so I, I grew up during the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and in Santa Barbara at that time, there was a, a, a pretty bad uh, gang problem. And it was to the point where, you know, my parents wouldn't let me out of the house because there was just so many gang members hanging out in front of every store on the West side. And uh, it just wasn't that safe. There's a lot of break-ins going on at that time. There's a lot of jumpings happening at that time. Um, so I grew up in this constant state of kind of like fear and uh, at some point in the late 90s, early 2000s, that started to change a little bit. Um, it it kind of comes in waves, you know, that, you know, the, the bad actors get, get put away or, or they decide to stop. But then a few years later, you know, 10 years or 20 years later, it all starts up again, you know. So, so we, I grew up in that, in that time where it was pretty bad. And um, I just, uh, what, by the time I was in high school, it was a little bit better. Uh, so I, I got into sports, I got into um, to video production that our, that our high school had, and, and it took my mind off of, of all the negative stuff that was going on and kind of paved my way into the person I am today. But, uh, but the cool thing about it was that our high school system, our school system requires the students to commit to a certain hours of community service. And at first, when I first heard about that, when I got into high school, I thought, you know, I was like, what, why are they making us work for free on top of going to school? You know, I was kind of puzzled by that and I didn't like it. And I, I think the first two years of high school, like my freshman and sophomore year, I did nothing. I did no community service. And then my, uh, my junior year was when my counselor brought me in and said, Oscar, if you don't get these hours done, you're not going to be able to graduate. So you, you got two years to like get this stuff done, you know? So then I, I told her that um, I didn't know where to volunteer, you know? And, and, uh, she, and, and then I told her that, you know, I was kind of interested in, in video because my dad had just bought us a, a video camera. And she said, oh, it's, it's, it's just weird, like, circumstance and just luck I guess but um she said that nonprofit had just started that records people telling their life stories before the people pass away and it's called life chronicles so she said if you want you know they do video stuff so that's how I got started actually I started working for this nonprofit and interviewing people telling their life stories and it gave me perspective when I was a teenager and I was kind of cynical where I didn't really care about anything. And I was kind of over the school system and just over the system in general. And then hearing people tell their whole life story of how they struggled and what they overcame and, and love and heartbreak. And it just kind of gave me a lot of like life knowledge at a really young, important time in my life that 
basically convinced me to, you know, follow a career and, and video and, and go to college and, and just kind of be, be an asset to my community, not a burden, you know? So, so uh, if it wasn't for the high school system requiring public or uh, community service, I don't even know where I'd be right now, you know? And it's just funny because like I said, I went into high school going, this is so lame. I can't believe they're going to make this. And then here I am, you know, 20 years later going, why well, I wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for the system making me do that, you know? So, um, so that's kind of how it was growing up. Uh, th like I said, we didn't feel like we were getting represented very well. I, you know, honestly, it wasn't until high school that I knew that we had like a city council or that we knew that I knew that I could talk to my city officials. I didn't know that until I was in high school, you know, when I was like starting to learn about how the government works. And I always thought that that was shocking, you know, to this day, I feel like that stuff should be taught on a grade school level, you know, to, so that the kids know that they have a voice, even as a child. I mean, now we have like the Santa Barbara Youth Council, which is comprised of all high school students and some even junior high kids that basically mimic the city council. And then they, they bring us their recommendations on policies and stuff. It's pretty cool. And then we didn't have that when I was in high school. Uh, we didn't have like a lot of the leadership programs like the Future Leaders of America that that I didn't have in high school. And, and you know, um, I feel like um, there's a lot of really cool um, opportunities for our youth now that we didn't have just less than 20 years ago. And the problem is trying to let the youth know about that and trying to get them to want to do it. Because it's one thing when you're like, you know, the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Some, some of these youth know that these organizations and programs are out there, but they just don't want to do it. And, and that's the hard part is like, how do you, how do you get them to actually want to do it? And, and I know what it's like, because I was very apathetic in high school too, you know? So I know what it's like to not want to care and feel like there's nobody out there who wants to help me, but there is. And, and that's, that's kind of like what I'm constantly trying to figure out. Like, how can I let them know that we're here to help, not here to control them? Like, we want them to succeed. We want them to become the leaders of tomorrow. Um, but we don't want to make them feel like they're being marginalized or alienated so so yeah that the, the times have definitely changed for the better a little bit um but we obviously still have a lot more work to do because um the representation isn't out there you can just look around even on the youth council i love the youth council but there there aren't that many minority students on there very true oscar you hit a lot of important points um sorry go ahead gina Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say something really um, to Oscar's personal story. It was a, a testament to exactly what you want to talk about today because the engagement of the youth is through the heart, their interests, what they love to do. And it turned out you love film. Um, I have a young, young um, Latino boy I mentor and he loves film. That's what he wants to do something. I'm going to hook him up with Oscar. <laughs> no, but it's just, sure. he doesn't know how to do it, but he knows he wants to do something and help people tell their stories. That's what you did. You found a way through the op opportunities provided that, wow, this is what I love to do. And that's engaging them on that level. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Go ahead, Allie. Yeah, Oscar. No, absolutely. They're all really good points. Um, that ties to something that is really current in our community that needs attention and we need to understand the importance of listening to youth voices so giving them that voice um, and also um, you know sharing our community because community service hours really do help you pair up to their passion and it's a good thing that it's you know kind of it's a requirement they're supposed to have 60 hours minimum and those 60 hours can really make the difference of which way they're gonna go and who they're going to be you yeah. know like you oscar yeah. um a lot of especially during the pandemic we are asking our youth to be healthy we're asking them to be active to do you know creative things and one of the things that santa barbara is so well known for is 
the outdoors, the bikes, and we currently, we're in fiesta mode. Um, we are having our annual fiesta cruise bike, which we saw that the flyer is out. There's a new pathway, um, but there are some barriers there. There's something that also we're, we're having an issue about how do we share the streets healthy and also advocate for our youth to be able to use their bikes, be out there, especially when they are doing it. And there's some restrictions that are happening currently that are actually could be really harmful specifically for our Latino youth. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about that? And I'm sorry, not just Latino youth, but marginalized youth, underserved yeah. youth. Sure. Um, uh, youth of color, absolutely. Um, so the city has spent decades trying to make Santa Barbara a more bike friendly city. And just this year, it was announced that Santa Barbara has become the top one of the top three cities in the country that is most bicycle friendly, which is a huge accomplishment and compliment to our city staff who has spent their careers getting us to this point. And um, which is great, right? Because bicycling reduces car traffic, it, recruits, it, it, re it reduces um, uh, pollution, it, it increases public health, you know, because people are getting exercise. Um, so, so th those are all positive, amazing things. So what happened was with the pandemic, we obviously shut down State Street, our main street uh, to cars. And we made it open for pedestrians and for um, businesses to be able to serve out in the street because studies have found that your, your um, chances of getting the coronavirus in the sunlight are extremely low because the ultraviolet light from the sun kills the virus very quickly. Um, so it's just safer to do your business and do your eating out in the sun as opposed to indoors. Um, so that's why we allowed the street to be shut down and businesses to come out. But with that, obviously it's no longer a street, so to speak. Um, so all these bicyclists all of a sudden were hit with these obstacles that they have to get, get around. So to to deal with that, the city put up these little signs saying, uh, dismount from your bike, get off your bike and walk your bike through this block, especially the 500 block. There's a lot of businesses on the 500, a lot of restaurants. And uh, it was kind of, it's kind of jarring for our writers and our, in our residents to get used to it. It just happened a couple of months ago and it's constantly changing. You know, um, we've had to make so many adjustments on how far the businesses can go out into the street and how narrow it can be and, and how many people could be seat, seated out there. So there's things that are constantly changing and, and it's taking time for the people to get used to it. Um, so one of, the, one of the groups that's taking time to get used to it is, is bicyclists and pedestrians. So State Street was the safest bicycle street that we had. And all of a sudden we just threw all these tables and chairs and people in there. So people are taking a, a long time to get used to that. And we now as a city have to do our part to re-educate the public to say, hey, we know it was like this for years, but now we got to change it because of this situation that we got ourselves in. Um, it's, just, it's just taking time because you know, when you do something for so long, it, it, you get used to it. So the moment it changes, you can't help but feel a little like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, we just got used to this. So there, there's been a lot of like tension and, and butting heads between the bicyclists and the, and the people who are on that specific block of State Street. And it, it's just gonna take a little patience on everyone's part. You know, it's summer. So a lot of the youth are not in school. It's, it's summertime. So they're going out and riding their bikes and hanging out. Um, which is great because they're getting a lot of exercise. And we just had a uh, meeting with the Santa Barbara Youth Safety Task Force. And when law enforcement uh, gave their, their updates, they actually said that youth crime is down significantly. And it could be because they're out riding bikes, you know. Um, and that's great. Uh, it's just that we just have to make sure that they know that certain parts of town is probably best for them to walk their bikes instead of riding their bikes, because there's been a lot of comments on social media and, and even from my fellow council members 
where they're voicing their their concern of the safety of the pedestrians, the businesses, and the riders themselves. So we need to start reaching out to them and, and letting them know that, you know, let's be safe about it because the last thing we want to do on the council is have to, you know, pass some new law or ordinance that says no more bikes on State Street or no more um, uh, popping tricks on your bike or or no more of this type of bike because it's easier to, to do tricks on. Uh, we don't want to do that. So we're just trying to do our best right now to reach out to as many organizations and community members and hopefully re-educate the people on how to properly ride their bikes. Yeah, Oscar, you make a lot of really, really good points about, you know, we're talking about prevention here, right? And we go back to like, let's go to the root. It's so important to listen to all our community members, give them a voice. You know, maybe this would have been voiced out before. Um, and youth, I mean, they're they're the ones out, you know, on the street trying to have fun. It's summertime as well, right? So it's fair that you know they are saying, "What happened? We were this was our thing, and now you're taking that away from us. What else, right?" So we want to be able to give them a space that is safe, also equitable, right? That everybody can be on it. Um, and it, that is super, super important. You're raising a point about um, voices and education. There's a partner here, a stakeholder, very important in our community, which is the parents, right? Um, parents are with our youth, you know, especially now during the pandemic, um, a long more time. So what would be your recommendations? What would be something that, you know, our parents that are listening um, could speak, like how, what, how can they have that dialogue? What are some of the safe ways to have um, this, what are the safe ways to ride your bike so that parents can take this information from here and have it with their youth? Uh, I would say, you know, obviously wearing uh, protective gear, so like helmets and and any kind of reflective vest so that you're easier seen at night, especially uh, having lights on your bike uh, so that you could see the bicyclists uh, riding around at night. Um, th th those are key. Um, I guess that the, the other thing addressing COVID um, specifically is wearing masks and try, try your best to not ride in too big of groups because that, that's another thing we keep hearing about is that uh, people are reporting seeing groups of like 10 or 15 or 20 youths on their bikes riding. And when you have that many bicyclists, it tends to block the street. So that, that's a little hard too. If you're going to ride, uh, you know, the professional bicyclists, they, they ride in a, in a straight line, you know, and they do that for a reason because they don't want to take up the street. So if that could be taught to them too, because right now they're just riding a big clump, a clump of bicyclists and that could be dangerous. Like if one rider falls, it could, they could trip all the other riders behind them and you can get multiple people hurt. So just, just things like that. And, and just to, to let them know, to try to stay off like really busy streets, like San Andreas or sorry, um, State Street and, and, and Milpa's, you know, because uh, those are very busy streets and um, it's easy to get, get into an accident on those streets and just obey the basic laws. You know, if you come to a stop sign, you have to stop, even if you're on a bike, you know, you're, you're treated just like any other vehicle, you know, and if you're going to turn, you got a signal and things like that. Just, just basic things like that. Yeah. Very true, Oscar. Um, this is important because there's talks about also ticketing them. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't want that for, you know, we want to advocate to be out there and right. do it safe and, and learn also how to share, right? Um, yeah. What is happening with the, with, the, with the bike crews? That's, you know, the annual Fiesta thing. I mean, it's been a tradition since 1979. Yeah. Um, there's a changes. And so what's going on with that? Sure. So um, the I think this is, this would have been the 40th anniversary of the bicycle, uh, San, the Santa Barbara Fiesta's cruiser run, they call it. And uh, it started about 40 years ago where a bunch of just friends got together and they rode their bikes up State Street after Fiesta's and they rode it all the way to Goleta Beach or to Isla Vista. And it became bigger and bigger every year. And I think last year, 
they had thousands of people show up with their bicycles and they rode up State Street and all the way out to Goleta. Um, obviously, now that State Street's blocked and now that we have a COVID uh, pandemic that we're dealing with, the, the original founders of the Cruiser Run decided to cancel it. But the thing is, is that he was getting responses from people saying, oh, we're still going to do it. So even though they officially canceled it, people are going to show up with their bikes, unfortunately. So what they did was they sent out a flyer saying that it was canceled. But if you are going to ride, avoid State Street and take a left on Gutierrez Street and basically take Bath Street all the way up to... Um, I think Alamar, and then from Alamar, you can get back onto State Street, avoid all the blockage from those first uh, uh, blocks, and then take that all the way to, to Goleta. So we're hoping people respect that. They, they, we, we hope that they avoid that block of State Street, because otherwise it's going to cause real problems with hundreds of people on bikes flooding that really narrow street now now that the tables are out in the street it's it's very narrow so hopefully they take that left and they go up either chapala or or bad um because it's just for safety you know we don't we don't want to spread this virus any more than it already is because our numbers are going up and and we we're trying to do our best and the police can only apprehend so many people right you know they can't really apprehend hundreds of people at once and, and honestly they don't want to do that either because they're very conscious of what's going on right now and they they don't want to over police people right now and especially about bicycling you know so so they they only want to do that as like a last resort so um they're they're being pretty understanding and lenient and we just have to be respectful and, and try to try to change Every, everything's changing no, 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 nothing is really staying the same too much so so we all have to do our part a little bit to just get along with everyone and and but still keep our identities you know very true um and that's the thing about this we want the information so what's in our hands what can we do who do we connect to right we connect with oscar um to give us a voice and advocate for youth voices as well. And also for everybody, right? We're talking about the bike groups as well, um, members of this community. Could you tell us also, because we're talking about fiestas here and we are we wanna protect our community, we really do. Yeah. So um, you had heard some comments or people have mentioned to you that people are selling the cascarones, right? The very traditional, um, you know, crack the eggs and it's fun and exciting, but there's some things that we wanna make sure our community is aware of so that um, they are not being ticketed or that they are not being policed. That is not fair and that's not okay. Yes. So we want them to have the information ahead of time and the resources. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah. So up until recently, actually, I think it was um, Fiestas of 2018. There was an incident where some state tax uh, revenue officials came into Santa Barbara and they during Fiestas and they witnessed people selling cascarones and water bottles and stuff. And they reported to us, uh, the city, and said, hey, there's people uh, who are, uh, there, there's vendors on your street that are selling things without a permit. And legally, if you're gonna sell something, you have to have a permit. And we, out of the, I don't know how many years has it been now, like 70 something years of Fiesta, we've never done that. We've never required people to have permits to sell cascarones, you know? Uh, but the state people witnessed it and all of a sudden they decided to hold us accountable and enforce it. So last year the, for the fiestas of 2019, I reached out to our um, state assembly member, Monique Limon, and she helped me do some outreach to uh, those Cascarones vendors to help them get permits so that they could sell it legally, just in case those state representatives came back looking to enforce it, they would have the proof that they went through the proper process of selling um, of selling things on the street, you know, and, and that was that was a great experience to work with her and to uh, do outreach to people that have been doing that since day one, basically, like, it, like Cascarones have 
literally been in, in Santa Barbara history since uh, the early 1800s when, um, I mean, it's, it's, in the, it's in the history books. Like people were cracking eggs over each other's heads even back then. And, and I did it growing up as a kid with my siblings. We, we made cascarones and we sold them and we, we cracked them over each other's heads. And, and it's just like a fun thing to do. And, and uh, yeah, so this year, obviously with fiestas being canceled, we've been getting reports that people have been seeing people selling cascarones. So we're trying to get them not to do that, obviously, mainly because of the, the COVID. We, we don't want people to be spreading things around, and especially when you're cracking things over people's heads and stuff. Um, so we just need to send the word out to the residents to like, please don't do that. Because one, technically now you need a permit. And two, um, it's just, it's just dangerous because of the virus and and yeah, it's unfortunate. It, it is a tradition, but but sometimes we have to sacrifice some things for the for the greater good and the health of the community. I know you have to make some really hard decisions too. I think that's the hard thing about being a leader. Um, but I also see that you are listening and you are mobilizing and you're acting on it. That is a beautiful example of looking at a you know an issue and then finding a creative and compassionate solution uh, mm -hmm. to still empower our community, to still really give them that voice and that um, the justice, right? So it's not easy, it's work in progress. There is a lot of work to be done um, and that could be also overwhelming at times. So Oscar, really quick before we wrap up, how do you take care of yourself? Because we want to advocate also about self-care, um, everyone, it, that 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 deserve, everybody deserves to take care of themselves as well to keep going right yeah. how do you take care of yourself uh, i don't know if you saw her but my my mom has a dog and <sighs> uh i walk her a lot and i play with her and uh i also ride my bike i have a bike that i ride around so th those are the two main things i do and then obviously i i, I love movies so I'll, I'll watch a movie or something to kind of take my mind off of things when i can and, uh, and yeah, those, those are the kind of the three main things I do. Um, it's tough because obviously uh, I live with my mom and, and she, she's high risk of, of, uh, of uh, you know, getting the, the, the virus. So I try to be as careful as possible. And, and uh, right now my girlfriend, she's actually finishing getting her master's in, in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. So she's been away for like a year now. So it's tough. But I, I call her every day. We FaceTime every day and I can't wait for her to come back. But even when she comes back, you know, she's going to have to quarantine for like two weeks. So she's going to be back, but like not back. And it's just stressful. But, you know, she helps me get through it. She I talk a lot of my stress out on her and vice versa. She talks a lot of her grad school stress out on me. And and uh, and yeah, that's that's basically how I take care of myself, how we take care of ourselves. Wow. Thank you so much for Beautiful. sharing, Oscar. That's wonderful. Thank you. Oscar, I, I want to, first of all, thank you for this conversation, this very down-to-earth, informative conversation. I learned a lot, and I'm going to share widely. I also have a picture that we'll put on Facebook of the new cruise run. I got a flyer from yeah. Saul Serrano, so awesome. I will share that right at the end of this conversation. We'll film it and then we'll put it on Facebook and uh, try to broadcast this as widely as possible. Yeah. But um, deep gratitude for your work, for our community and for you, my friend Ali, also for our youth, fierce, fierce advocates, both of you, for our community and our um, brothers and sisters and our children. Thank you very much. And you. Uh, unless you have any close words, Oscar, if there's anything else you want to say, otherwise we'll. Uh, just know that I'm here for everyone. If at any point you want to reach out to me, please do. Um, I check my email every day. I check my phone every day. Um, and if there's anything you, you have regarding, like if there's any youth out there that, that wants to, to get more involved in their community, let me know. Cause I, I know a lot of the groups and, we can find something that they might be into. You never know. There, there, there's bicycle nonprofits. There's uh, senior nonprofits. There's video nonprofits. There's, there's a lot of nonprofits out there that they could get, get uh, involved and, with. And we'll uh, put your email in the Facebook also, Oscar. Can you say your email and then 
uh, we can post it. It's it's a is it's O Gutierrez. O right? Gutierrez at Santa Barbara C A dot gov. So okay, O Gutierrez at Santa Barbara C A dot gov, and we'll post Correct. it also. And they can also reach out to SBRN, and we can forward any questions to you. Awesome. Once again, thank you. We'll put thank up you. the flyer run and. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nida, for interpreting. Have a wonderful day. Que tengan un bonito día. Adiós, los vemos. Bien, bonito día. Gracias.